for this first session, we have uh, it's on the um, the puzzle maker uh, Stuart Coffin. But to introduce him, um, we have uh, Rob Jones, who is actually on the board of directors of the Gardner Foundation. Rob, great. Um, everyone can hear. Uh, thank you all for, for for being here. I hope you're all having a a good time so far. Um, I want to make sure everyone feels uh, more than welcome to come up to me or to any of the members of the board of directors of the G4G Foundation with any kind of feedback uh, you'd like to offer on, on the gathering. We want, uh, we want your gathering to be as enjoyable and inspiring as possible. Um, and with that, can I have the, uh, the, the overhead, please? A reading um, from Martin Gardner's letter to Tom Rogers, dated June 26, 2007. Martin Gardner remarks, in case you haven't seen Stuart Coffin's latest, you must get one. It's the finest dissection puzzle of all time. It looks easy, but actually is fiendishly difficult. I wasted a week trying vainly to solve it. How Coffin ever managed to invent it beats me. When Tom sent Stewart a copy of this letter, Stewart quietly renamed his design number 217 to Martin's Menace. <clears throat> and you'll hear more about it from Stewart tomorrow morning. Stewart Coffin creates uniquely compelling poetic expressions, drawing upon geometry, combinatorial theory, logic, spatial perceptions, fine woodworking, philosophy, and last but not least, psychology. In 2018, we celebrate the 50th anniversary of Stuart's embarking upon an epic voyage of discovery in the design and crafting of geometric assemblies. Stuart refers to this body of work, now including over 350 designs, as app art, short for geometric art that comes apart. And now, can we uh, please start the slideshow? So please uh, extend a warm welcome to Stuart Coffin. This afternoon, we offer you an unrehearsed discussion between Stuart and three experts who know Stuart's work as collectors, scholars, and collaborators. Your panel leader, leader is John Rausch in the middle. John produced a comprehensive scholarly compendium of Stuart's designs in 2003, and most recently collaborated with Stuart on its 2018 upgrade, a 320-page volume documenting Stuart's work, which you will all be able to download after the gathering is my exchange gift to you. Next, we have Bill Cutler, sitting closest to me. Uh, Martin Gardner linked Bill and Stewart in his January 1978 Scientific American column. Martin identified Bill as a pioneer in using computers to explore puzzle design. And in the same article, Martin wondered at Stuart Coffin's elaborate and unusual line of original Burr puzzles, crafted by hand from hardwoods. This would not be the last time these two were favorably mentioned together in Scientific American, and over the decades, Bill and Stewart have maintained a fruitful interaction. And last but not least, sitting furthest from me, Nick Baxter is one of the world's top puzzle experts. He leads national puzzle solving teams, presides over international puzzle design juries, and operates the oldest established permanent online auction dedicated to puzzles. Since 2006, he has sold over 900 pieces designed by Stuart Coffin, with over 600 actually made by Stuart Coffin. His great knowledge and experience enables him to cast uh, Stuart's work in perspective with particular authority. And with that, I hand you over to your, your panel. Well, Stuart, uh, a lot of people know you as a puzzle designer and a puzzle maker, but most people really don't know that you uh, really started uh, more in outdoor type activities as a wilderness canoeer and uh, quite a quite a expert at it didn't you and your wife uh, uh, help uh, develop the Appalachia Mountain Guide uh, canoeing stuff to uh, Maine was it or no all of New England before you started making puzzles so. well that that's a long story and I've actually written a book the black spruce journals which is pretty much autobiographical about our canoeing explorations, but I met my wife in a canoe <laughs> in 1954. <laughs> we were married a year later, and we spent a lot of our good years together. And fortunately, she died of breast cancer in 1991. Yeah, well, that uh, 
that book is uh, something that's really worth, uh, is it available still from you if people are interested in it? No. Well, we could talk it's, about maybe it's other, hard to find now. other opportunities to make yeah. it available. But uh, from his canoeing activity, he started uh, making uh, fiberglass paddles and fiberglass canoes, first in, first in the world, first in this country, I think. Well, I, I developed the, uh, a, uh, the canoe and kayak paddles that were composite construction. I guess they were the first. They were made with aluminum, fiberglass, and uh, epoxy. So, so from there, could you tell people a little bit about how you transitioned from uh, canoeing and making canoes and paddles into uh, making don't making puzzles? Don't forget the buttons. Well, it was it was rather abrupt because I was dealing with some very uh, poisonous and toxic chemicals and making uh, working with fiberglass, and um, I had three little girls, and I, it was not certainly not healthy for me nor for them. So I abruptly quit and decided to do something else. That's this whole story. Yeah, and and you made the puzzles and sold them at trade fairs. And well, I, uh, I, my, both my parents were artistic. So I, um, actually, if you want to go into that, I, yeah. uh, my father, encouraged me to, uh, in, in scientific and mathematical things, and he gave me a book in 1950 that pretty much made an impression on me. It was um, Mathematical Snapshots by Hugo Steinhaus. That was when it actually was published in 1950. And I never forgot it. So 18 years later, I found myself looking for something to do. And I thought, um, maybe I'll uh, get into uh, sculpture, a geometric sculpture. So I started tinkering with that. And that book started gradually coming back to me, and I was fascinated by the rhombic dodecahedron. So I fashioned some, and I discovered that it could be enclosed by 12 triangular sticks, and that led in turn to 12 intersecting hexagonal rods, which was my first successful design called Hex Sticks. And at the same time, I had the very good fortune of running into Tom Atwater in nearby Concord, who was an agent for puzzle and game inventors. What a coincidence. And he took an interest and he licensed that puzzle to 3M Company. They manufactured about 100,000 of them, molded in styrene. I collected a, a small royalty on each one. And that's what got me started. Uh, could, you t could you tell a little bit about the problems that uh, 3M Manufacturing had uh, getting all these 100,000 puzzles assembled? Well, I know what you're driving at. <laughs> that, that's, uh, that's in my book, and it's a story I love to tell. Um, the, uh, they were molded in nearby Clinton, Massachusetts by Nylon Products Company, later called Nipro. And um, I went out there and visited them a few times when they were getting set up to manufacture, and sure enough, those puzzle, 12 puzzle pieces came spewing out of their injection molders like anything. And it was a relatively new process for them because it involved a blowing agent because they weren't thin walled like most of their products, but they were three quarters of an inch thick, which was a little bit, of, but they managed. And then the problem became of assembling them. They were assembling them with union chemical workers. That proved to be very unprofitable for them. So we, we had a, a conference out there, which I attended, and um, we discussed the problem of assembling them. I said, no problem, ship them to my plant in Lincoln. I don't know if I hear any giggles, but a few of you know this story already, I'm sure. Uh, our plant consisted of a picnic table on our backyard. It was summer vacation for our three little girls. I, and I charged NIPRO four cents a piece to assemble them. I paid the girls two cents a piece, so everybody came out ahead. <laughs> and we assembled about 20,000 in a few weeks. And then, for some reason, the rest of them were assembled somewhere else, and I, I know nothing about that. Um, so for a long time, fur puzzles were always on a, a cubic geometry. And you've already mentioned the rhombic dodecahedron. You introduced that. Tell us more about 
what made that so attractive? Were there magical discoveries? Was it the combinatorics? What brought you to the rhombic dodecahedron? Well, um, first of all, I told you about that book by Steinhaus, which mentioned it and described it in some detail. So I had that as a start. And I see, is that, is, is that showing? Uh, yeah. That's what the audience sees. I, uh, I used that uh, basic geometry over and over again in various forms. Because, uh, as I said, that uh, could be enclosed by 12 triangular sticks, and that, that led, in turn, to a whole, whole load of ideas. So some of the designs, uh, I think of Rosebud, I think of Star of David, where you had multiple assemblies, uh, some more interesting than others, some mm -hmm. with coordinate motion. Uh, how did you discover the beauty of coordinate motion and, and turn that into puzzles? Coordinate motion was probably, a lot of this stuff was accidental. I, um, I tinkered a lot. I spent so much time tinkering that uh, it would have been probably better spent actually producing, but I, I was just, uh, I did it really as a, a self-interest. Uh, the, the business end of it was not very profitable. It might have been if I had been a business person, but I was, I was more of a dreamer and an inventor. And some of that stuff just came naturally out of experimenting endlessly over and over. A lot of your designs are easier to take apart uh, than put together. And <laughs> OK, everyone's had that experience. Uh, but I think it's true for Stuart as well. Uh, we had a conversation about uh, an Alta Cruz variation that you created uh, called Confessional, where you squashed it at a certain angle. And assembly and disassembly requires a rotation, kind of unexpected. And I asked, how did you come up with that? And uh, you revealed your secret technique, that you broke one of the pieces, uh, assembled most of it, and then re-glued the 12th piece in place. And then you could experiment with whether or not it fell apart. So do you have other secret techniques like that? Or <laughs> well, what can you tell us? <laughs> well, to begin with, uh, this, this book that you'll receive as um, all my designs are uh, listed by a serial number. That's the only way I can keep track of them all. And I guess there must be about uh, four, 400, between four and 500, plus the many others that never got listed. And uh, so they, there's a huge variety of things. And a lot of that is just, uh, just experimental. And I, uh, if, if you study what I've done over the years, you see that there's been a gradual change. I started out uh, thinking in terms of puzzles. And in my presentation tomorrow, by the way, I'm not going to use the word puzzle, uh, except that where it's capitalized, but I can't avoid that. And um, so it's, it's been from puzzles more to mathematical recreations, to uh, artistic ideas and development, and a little bit of philosophy behind it, too. Just trying to, uh, the idea of exploration. And I'm hoping that uh, especially young people will be attracted to it. Uh, uh, our relationship goes back quite a ways. I think <laughs> perhaps the longest of the three of us. And uh, my first encounter with you, I guess I'll call it that, was actually quite a few years before we met. Uh, I was fiddling around, I was in college, and I was fiddling around with a six-piece burr and saying, what if I try and put rods in more than three directions, like in four directions of the diagonals of a cube? And before long, I was cutting out a puzzle out of some 12 pencils, making notches in them, <laughs> and put them together and showed them to my classmates at Brown. And a few years later, I was in LSU showing them them the colleagues, and one of them came up and said, hey, I see they're making your puzzle. And he showed me a magazine with an advertisement from 3M about this puzzle called Hectics. And I said, where the heck did they get that from? Well, in another couple of years, I got connected to you through uh, another professor, I think, at Rutgers, who gave me Atwater and uh, your name, and I came up and saw you for the first time, and obviously then the 
the, what, what had happened was clear. You, you designed the two completely independent design uh, people designing the same thing. Um, and uh, then, of course, I started buying your puzzles, and I would advise people, go up there and buy whatever he will sell you. <laughs> <laughs> so my quite, we all have our favorite designs of yours, but what I'd like to ask you is, what are your favorite designs? What designs gave you the most pleasure to design, the most, you got the most satisfaction? What are your favorite designs that you came up with? Well, I'm sometimes asked that, and uh, in, my, um, in my book, there's a certain amount of indication by the amount of space I spend for each one. But, and with that, of course, that would include Hectics, which was the first, and that has a big family connection with my three little girls. Uh, one of the, my earliest memories of that is we did a show on Channel 22 in Springfield, the Tom Colton show about uh, the three girls doing, putting puzzles together. And this was back in the days, by the way, when they did not record, it was all live. They didn't have recorded programs much back then. So we did it live, and I had the idea, since they had been assembling these hundreds and hundreds of puzzles, they, they got so they could do it without even looking and thinking. They were doing it automatically. So the oldest daughter would be assembling one blindfolded on the Tom Colton show. This was a bit risky, and we allowed five minutes for it, and we uh, practiced, and she did it uh, in practice in less than five minutes. So I had her fingers crossed. She came through, and uh, I, I, I wished we'd had a recording of that. But I have all these good memories of my family. And we did a lot of craft shows. That's how we got started, doing uh, summer craft shows. And that was pretty much seasonal. And uh, it was uh, led to some wholesale work, which was fine. And that was uh, not seasonal anymore. But the, of course, anything you sell wholesale, you get a 50% uh, off of your retail price. So, and, and I was using a lot of expensive wood. So it wasn't very profitable. So I was very lucky in 1978 that Martin Gardner mentioned me in one of his columns. And wow, that changed everything. I, uh, I, I had developed a mailing list from that uh, nationwide and even worldwide. And um, so you sold a lot of these. And I, I think I heard you mention that you thought a lot of your puzzles were bought by uh, mothers of rich executives who would put them on their mantelpiece and never take them apart. Did, did that ever change, uh, have an effect on whether you made them or anything? Um, no, but once in a while I would get somebody would uh, a call or even they'd visit and they'd say they had one of my uh, fancy productions in their, in their display in their living room and some unruly child <laughs> had taken it apart and could I please put it together or maybe tell them how to put it together and send instructions. Because a lot of times, I didn't include instructions. It was, uh, I had this nasty sort of uh, thing about me back then. And, and that, that's changed somewhat over the years. I include instructions now. Because what's the point of having a beautiful uh, piece of art if it's in pieces? Are there any, are there any other puzzles other than hectics that uh, come to mind that really were special for you? Well, that one there we oh, call yeah. Jupiter. Jupiter. <laughs> and, yeah, I and that, that's really just a sculpture that comes apart. It's, it's not, I wouldn't call it a puzzle. It's 12 pieces made of six dissimilar woods. And um, it, uh, there's, oh, there's a story that goes with that, I've got to tell. It was the centerpiece of our display at craft shows. And um, our youngest daughter then was about nine years old, and, and she was pretty good at putting them together. Well, they all were, but she was the youngest and the cutest, of course. And so we would plant her in the audience. And at craft shows back then, they, they, crashed, they had pottery and candles and jewelry, and pottery and candles and jewelry. So the crowds flocked to our booth. Uh, some of the others complained that it was blocking things up. But anyways, we had a big crowd, and I'd have that as a centerpiece, and I would toss it in the air, and it would fall apart. 
into 12 pieces, gently, of course. And I'd say, anybody that can put it back together can have it. Well, the audience, <laughs> adult, they didn't want to be embarrassed. <laughs> Very seldom would they even try. And, but uh, the youngest girl would be planted in the audience, and she'd work her way to the front, and I would be paying no attention. And she'd start fiddling with it, and then I'd hear that clunk, that characteristic sound, as the two halves went together. The cloud, I'd know they'd start laughing, and she'd tuck it under her arm, walk away, <laughs> and then someone would ask, by any chance, is that little girl your daughter? But it worked over and over. We just, <laughs> and we had fun with that. We had a lot of fun. Yeah, I uh, tried that throwing the Jupiter up in the air with a little bit of spin, a little too, um, with a little too much energy. Three of the pieces broke. They never fit back together right. <laughs> I didn't have your gluing jigs. Well, I guess along that vein, I have some puzzles of yours that are upwards of 40 years old, and they assemble just as well uh, now as they did when they were new. Um, tell us about some of your woodworking, prep, uh, cutting, how did you produce puzzles that age so well and perfectly? Well, first of all, I was never really an expert woodworker. And a lot of, there have been a lot of reproductions made by others who are, I, I won't bother to name them because if I did, I'd, I'd be sure to leave some out. But uh, they're mentioned in my book, and a lot of you probably know who they are. But my problem was that I was always get started on something, I'd be thinking ahead to the next one. So I want to finish this and go on to the next. I never, if I were doing it over again, I would try to develop more woodworking techniques like some of the others have. However, to answer your question now, it all is done with very accurate gluing jigs. The sawing jigs and gluing jigs, they're both quite important. They have to be made accurate to within a few thousandths of an inch made out of metal and cast in epoxy, sometimes hardwood, stable woods like teak and rosewood. So um, the other thing is that all woodworkers know that you have a problem around here with humidity, winter and summer. They swell up in the summer and shrink in the winter. And um, that's something you have to deal with. Uh, one of the first things I did early on, I was dealing with about 30 or 40 different kinds of wood back then, and by and at the end, about 100 different kinds. So I made cubic samples of all the woods I was using at the time, measured them with a micrometer on all three axes, the uh, length of the grain across the growth rings and beside the growth rings, if they had any, if for tropical woods, of course, they didn't. And um, then I tabulated them all for stability and made a list of the most and least stable woods. All the domestic hardwoods did poorly. Uh, walnut was about the best, but it didn't do too well. But most of the oily tropical woods were very good. Uh, teak, rosewood, mahogany. Uh, so blackwood, African blackwood, uh, ebony. All those. Uh, so then um, these people that do this really accurate work that I don't do, do as I've described, but they're just more meticulous, just uh, taking pains to make sure it's right. I dealt with, I used a micrometer all the time to measure up to an inch and uh, vernier calipers for anything over than that. And then the angles to within a half a degree, if you can managed to imagine that. That's how it's done. OK, you mentioned the angles. Um, how did you do the math? There was a lot of math to get those angles, to get the jigs just perfect. Ah, the math. I was not a mathematician. I mean, I studied, I was an engineer. I studied engineering math, which was poof, uh, differential and integral calculus and differential equations, complete waste. Never used it. but. <laughs> The, the math, and I've had people at Craft Chase, oh, you must have been the mathematician. The math and what I did was so simple. I dealt, I had three saw jigs that 
did most of my sawing. One was obviously right angles, 45 degrees, and the, the third one was for sawing triangular sticks at the right angle. Um, so the math, there, there's a certain amount of math that, that has to do with combinatorial theory. I mean, I studied the combinatorial math in high school, and nothing to it really, uh, the, the, uh, the type that I use. Uh, you can work it out yourself, but I, I used it a lot. And then later, I had a computer. So that's the, now I use the computer. We won't ask you about your adventures with the computer. <laughs> you know, you know uh, when I put out the uh, Puzzling World of Polyhedral Dissections book on, the, uh, on a CD that people could buy on Amazon, uh, one of the first reviews that came out said, uh, I bought this CD thinking it was a math book, and there's absolutely no math in here. Yes. It was the title that he was objecting to. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I remember that. And I, I can understand. He was right. Well, uh, I, I still, I don't know what I heard. I still heard a name of your favorite. Well, I guess you said Hextix, but that, that was your only real commercial venture. But uh, you have another, another one of the ones that you only sold five or ten of mm. or something that you really liked? Uh, that, was, that was a lot of, that you were very proud of making? Or? How are we doing for time? Well, yeah. one more answer. Okay. So I really want to talk about Martin Gardner because um, I, I knew his, of his column uh, way, way back, and I told you already that he mentioned me in 1978, which got me started. And we corresponded over the years, but mostly in the later years when he was back in Oklahoma. I wished I had saved that, uh, more of that correspondence. Uh, Rob mentioned the one letter that, that was saved. However, what I remember most about Martin Gardner was our correspondence about poetry and music. Yes, we were both interested in it, and we compared notes. And we, found, we, we thought very much alike. So uh, I think Martin wrote a certain amount of verse, did he not? I, I meant to read his autobiography before I came here, but I couldn't locate a copy. Does anybody know if he wrote verse? I know he was interested in it. And um, uh, so he and I agreed that uh, light verse didn't work unless it had rhyme and meter. And furthermore, if it sang, that was his expression, if it sang. And it, it perfect. He put it perfectly. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk with us on the stage here. It was a lot of fun. That's I'd, it. I'd also like to admit that I sent you a letter in 1978 as a result of that article, and you sent me back a list of five puzzles that were like $30 and $35. Yeah. And I thought, oh, my God, too much <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> there you are. <laughs> okay, let's thank uh, Stuart Coffin and the panelists, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you.